Good evening, all, and welcome to the second of the presidential election series that we're, we're doing here with regards to how we're actually going to trade and look at the US election going forward. Um, since I last did my last one of these two weeks ago, there has been an incredible change. There's no doubt about that. Everything that could be under a way that Trump runs things has sort of somewhat come to fruition in that it's been chaotic. It has been different. It has changed incredibly fast. Um, all of the above, and, and I will go through that. Originally, the idea was that this, we were, what we were going to do with this discussion tonight was go through the first debate and then talk about the second debate and all the other stuff with regards to you know, what you're likely to see from the candidates going forward. Clearly, that's slightly been thrown out the window with what has now happened in the last two weeks, and, and I'll get to that. Uh, but we, we do need to, therefore, go back through, we don't need to, as I said the last time, and I'll say it again, we don't need to be US political scientists, <clears throat> but we need to understand what to watch so that when we are there, not only that on the day, not just trading on the day, but if you are going to be trading leading into it, if you are going to have open positions during the day and possibly straight after it, you probably need to have some idea of what, what could happen because 2016, US election was, was an education, but I'd even go further than that. Brexit was an education. The US, Scottish independence vote was an education for particularly people like us who do trade short term, who are using leverage, who do have a scenario where market moving events of a day can, can actually catch you out. So we need to talk about all of those things as well. Before I go any further, first and foremost, admin on the side, obviously you go to webinar control panel. I actually quite like to have questions coming as you think of them. So please, if you do see them, obviously there's a question bar on the right-hand side, there's a little arrow, down click it, put your question in there, and I will actually interrupt myself and, and answer it. I think it's much, much more interactive. It's a much better way. Other thing I always say when I start these as well is that I don't know all the answers, and I think that needs to be put out there straight and foremost. And if you've got an opinion, and an idea, please put that up because I want to also therefore bring it to the, to the group. Uh, not just for the here and now watching, but it's also to those that watch this after the fact, because it can always help. The whole idea of this is to actually work as a unit to make ourselves better educated, better understanding of what could happen to not just, as I said, trade the day, but also affect our trades leading into, during and after. And even though you might not even have direct links to the US election, it will move markets and it will move your positions. So therefore, you you know, having this understanding and working as a group, understanding what the group is doing will help us as well. So just before I go any further, as always, please have a very good read through of the disclaimer on the screen. Do need to sort of make sure that you understand all of this is, is general in nature. None of it's obviously personal advice. FP Marcus does not need a personal scenario, nor do I. And I'm obviously an independent person coming in for FP to talk about that. So just remember, have a good read of the disclaimer on screen and go from that. I'm actually going to go back to the title page first before I go any further. <clears throat> the whole idea of today is to start talking about what could happen on the day, what we saw in 2016, what's happening with regards to swing states um, and how they look, um, and then also talking about what you may actually see uh, in terms of movements on the day and where also to look, because it's not just looking at markets, it's looking at a few other inputs that actually affected and has affected trading in the past and will affect it on the day. And I'm going to preempt that by saying you need to also probably have a fair understanding about how the bookies move. I know that's a really horrible thing to say and it's not somewhere that I want to advocate for. But the reason I say that is that 2016, the bookies had a huge influence on FX and a huge influence on futures because of how unexpected 2016 is was. Sorry, And that's why it needs to still be party thinking in 2020 because the unexpected is still every chance of happening. And I think you need to remember that. It is still every chance that Trump could win. It is him. So let's get to that. So for those of you that don't look um, with regards to how the college system works, and just very quickly, I've seen that uh, Muhammad's coming with a question. Hi, all. Yep. Hi, Muhammad. Good to see that you're here. I'll keep talking on. I put this up last time um, when we spoke about it. What I want to point out is that at the top there, the expectations are you need to get to win the electoral college votes in the US, 170 electoral college votes. For those of you that are sort of slightly unaware about that, what that means, the 
map on screen and the numbers there are the amount of college votes that are allocated to each independent state um, or territory, because there are a couple of territories in the US. Why that matters, it goes all the way back to the founding fathers and having a look at the constitution. The original reason of how it was done like this was to make sure that some of the bigger states didn't overwhelm the smaller states and therefore you didn't have candidates that were basically deliberately concentrating on a California, for example, or a New York or on a Texas because they're so incredibly large and they can actually therefore get you across the line without even trying. Um, it was basically to make sure, particularly as we all hear about the Midwest states, I hope you can see my, my cursor in there, um, you know, you, your North South Dakotas, your Minnesotas, your Idawas of this world, your Kansases, all these kinds of places that sometimes do get overlooked, um, get, get a fair representation. So to get that, to get a majority, you need 270 electoral votes. The other thing to be aware of is that if you take a state, you get all of those. You don't just get you know, the portion that you manage to get. So for example, let's say we look at something like Florida, where you could end up finding a scenario where it might've been something like sort of what, 14 to 15, because obviously Florida's got 29. Um, if it's sort of a half and half or, a, you know, again, it could be depending on the percentages, it doesn't work like that. If you take a state, you get the whole thing. Um, and that's what's going on here. Why I wanted to highlight that and what I'm talking about with regards to up at the top. Last time we showed you this chart and this chart comes from what has probably been seen in the US as the most consensus based group to actually give us data, which is RCP, um, Real Change Politics. You can go on the web, oh, you can go online and see it. It's fantastic. This collates every single poll that is going on in the US, whether it's left, right, center, TV station, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. These guys are collating it and then putting it together as a consensus view. And the last time we did this, Biden was on 222. He's now up to 226. Um, and I'll go through on that in terms of, of what's happened. There has been some really interesting changes that have come um, over the last couple of weeks. Now, before I go any further, I will clearly talk about two things. There are conspiracy theorists out there that are suggesting, and I was talking to the FB before about this with regards to whether or not Trump did or did not have COVID. He's definitely had it. Now, I need to put that out there that there is no arguments about that. He's definitely had it. Um, and, and that needs to be an absolute lock in. But it has also meant that it's changed the dynamics of the debates. We're clearly not having one tomorrow. Oh, sorry, on Friday, we were supposed to have one on, on the 15th. That's not going to happen. Um, it would have been the 16th for us here in Australia. It's also unlikely that we're going to have a third one because the other thing that is realized from the last debate, which was an absolute shambles from both candidates, probably the worst presidential election debate I've ever seen. And I've been watching these for a fair while, all the way back to 1996 when I was even a kid. I still loved watching them. Um, it, it wasn't a debate, as I'm sure you're all aware. It was a shouting match. It was the biggest issue I had with it, not just the fact that obviously it was just completely undignified. You didn't get any policy. You didn't get any guidance for the future of the, of the country. Biden played incredibly safe and basically made sure that there was no punches that, that Trump could land on him and didn't really say anything controversial, didn't do anything that really said, this is my alternative view for the US people, for the US economy, for the treatment of COVID. He sort of said, you know what it is, deal with it. And then obviously Trump just continued to talk. Um, and I think that's the way to say it. He just talked about anything um, and it was horrible. So there probably now won't be a second and third debate it'll be rallies. And that therefore brings into the discussion of today's this talk and why it matters so much for your trading. It's around the purple states. Um, and for those of you that uh, sort of don't understand the term of purple, obviously in the US, if you're a Republican, you're red. If you're a Democrat, you're blue. Put those two colors together, you're purple. Uh, but why it's so interesting is that, and again, I'm just gonna try and get my cursor up here. Just wait. Go to my uh, sometimes can be a little bit tricky, and I think that's coming up. Um, the why it's interesting is that the purple states that are currently up at the moment are not the ones we've always assumed. Um, and and what I mean by that is is that you've got a scenario at the moment where Georgia has all of a sudden possibly inverted commas become a purple state, which has been a red state all the way back to the 60s. 
If you look at somewhere also like North Carolina, that's an amazing state. It's probably one of the biggest swing states around. But some people are even suggesting that Texas could be a swing state. I don't believe that. Uh, I really don't. But the reason it's happening is that in even with COVID and in the new world, and even in the last four years, the US has seen quite a large movement of people. People are now moving out of big, big cities and moving into regions. They're finding that the ability to work across the country has improved. Um, they're also changing their lifestyle and their habits. And therefore, groups of people that originally were from Texas are migrating to Florida to retire. Or, you know, you're now starting to see a lot of business flowing through places like Dallas and um, no, Lake, Houston, which have always been there, but all of a sudden they're attracting a new group of people um, that are bringing that way. The other thing that's happening, and it's happens across the world, the suburbia uh, sort of vote has changed uh, in terms of what it is. It, it used to be quite a conservative vote. Now there's an argument that suburbia is becoming a little bit more liberal and, and maybe leaning a little bit more left. And that also therefore changes up places like North Carolina, South Carolina, where that kind of sort of thinking lives. It also means that you're starting to see places like, you know, Nevada over here, which has been flip-flopping, also starting to move in those ways. So it's, it's an interesting time to come back to all of that and, and why it's there. So going on that and getting back to my point about Trump particularly, he is now going to, in my view, he is going to blitz it. He is going to try and get to the big purple states that matter to him and realistically matter to the overall number, which is this number up here. He needs to get to 270. So he needs to get his hands on some big, big purple states, the ones that actually got him the, the, the chair at the White House in the Oval Office last time. And these are the states, Florida, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina. And he has to therefore also hold onto places like Georgia, places like Texas, and hold them easily. And he will. He'll hold those last two. But the catch for him is that the belt that voted him in have started to wane. They're also the ones that have felt COVID the most. Um, and that's all part of this discussion. So let's talk about the purple haze because that's where we, we need to start with. Um, and the one from my perspective that probably is the biggest for all of you out there with regards to your trading is Florida. It's why he was there today. And if you didn't see it, go and have a look at it. He promised to kiss everybody that votes him in in the, in the key state of Florida. Because in my view, it is absolutely the linchpin to all of this. Because on the day, if Florida falls to Biden, it's probably game over. As you can see on this slide at the bottom, the electoral votes are 29. It would be almost impossible, going by what's going on with regards to the polls, for him to win, uh, to him to recover if Florida fell to Biden. Um, and it's, it's still there, like it's much, much tighter. So this chart, I must admit, when I was trying to get it off Real Clear Politics, I was trying to get it closer than it is. 3.7 percentage points seems like a lot. And you can see that since the first debate, since Trump obviously had to you know, isolate himself with COVID, he has dropped away, that is clear. But I wouldn't say it's at a point now where it's absolutely game off. Um, and it's why you've seen Biden down there himself. They have a huge Latino community in, in Florida. Um, and why that's important is that a lot of the Latino community in that state have escaped socialist nations. It's why Trump very much tries to hype up the idea that not just Biden, but Kamala Harris, his running mate, are a socialist sort of scenarios. You've also got a scenario where they're quite conservative and don't forget, we're not just talking about the White House when we look at the US election, we're also talking about the Senate and the House. And the two candidates for the Senate in, in Florida for the Republicans are both very, very high standing Latino uh, Cuban co um, community members that actually have a probability of, of winning quite well. Um, so I actually find this quite interesting. I think it's probably too big. Um, and as you can see, what I've also done down here, this was what was happening down here in 2016. And why I highlight that and why I talk about the bookies, this was the state that mattered for everything. The reason I wanted to do this at the start of my presentation is I understand people will turn off and that's all well and good. But from my perspective, Florida is absolutely the most important state out there because no one thought he could win it in 2016. 
it comes out, and I've also deliberately started to put these up here. It comes out uh, with regards to the time that it declares. So if you are listening to this somewhere else in the world or somewhere else in South in Australia, I do apologise, but it came out at 11 a.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And I've gone back and had a look and it's roughly the same all the way I can see, all the way back to 2000. Why it mattered is that I was, and I'm going to give you an anecdotal story here and I do apologise, I was sitting on a trading floor. Um, I was deliberately... Um, I was deliberately looking at um, the whole thing with regards to listening to the trading floor. Sorry, apologies. I just had a question come in, but I'm just having a read of it. It's all good, back, uh, all well and good. And I'll come back to what Evan has put up there because it's actually perfect. It's with regards to the betting markets, and I'll, I'll definitely want to show that. Um, it's, it's why why I highlight this. Apologies, I just lost my train of thought. Is that on the day on the day. Everything was ticking along as expected, and it was moving that way. We were watching the bookies on the trading floor because the bookies were actually also causing market movements. You're starting to see quite reasonable fluctuations in euro dollar. You were seeing fluctuations in cable, which was therefore moving dollar basket as well. It was also moving US futures. So particularly the S&P and Dow futures, they were starting to get a little bit sort of tentative. But around about 10 to 11, and even about actually five minutes to 11, there was growing suggestions that all of a sudden something was going and was going, because you actually get the live counting, right? And it was getting to a point where all of a sudden people were starting to realize that the votes that were coming in was going to actually show that Trump was going to win Florida. And why I say 10 to 10 and, and five minutes to 11 was so important, sorry, 10 to 11 and five minutes, was that all of a sudden the bookies wiped their markets. They disappeared completely offline. And what then happened is that you saw this ginormous spread happen in FX. So don't forget that FX is um, uh, over the counter and it caused this, the, the banks that obviously offer these markets to sort of lose understanding about where the market actually could be and they just widen their spreads. And I, I'm not talking about, you know, widening from 0.6 of a pip to something like one. We're talking about slight tens. So all of a sudden, you know, for instance, Euro dollar, I remember went from being about 112 to 112 30 to over 50, give or take, because it was trading at a slightly wider spread because of the risk, to all of a sudden being like 111.9 to 113.10, and then it disappeared. So that's why, for me, Florida matters. And it needs to be part of your thinking when we look at Florida. Because what then happened, five minutes later, the bookies came back, and having Trump was then around about $2.50, Trump all of a sudden was odds on favorite at $1.10 in that space of time. And it changed the markets so incredibly rapidly that that is why for me on the day, I will be having an alarm at 10 a.m. and at 10.30, making sure that I am fully aware of the counting going on in Florida. But, and I also need to put this in, but 2020 is like no year we've ever seen. COVID-19 is a massive, massive part of this election. And why I say that today, the electoral uh, roll out of Florida came out and said that they have not seen this amount of mail-in voting in basically 30 years. So we may or may not get the result on the day because mail-in voting has clearly happened. What's also interesting is that, that COVID is playing into local politics. Um, one of Trump's biggest supporters, the governor of Ron DeSantis, has been heavily criticised down there in Florida for his handling of it. Um, he originally almost dismissed it as basically being complete furphy um, and reopened early, et cetera, et cetera. Don't forget Florida's demographic is that they are an older generation, therefore they've got a higher chance of catching it. And around 750,000 Floridians have had COVID and it will be an issue for him. That, that is clear. But again, just getting back to this point, that gap, I think it's not going to be as big as that, but it certainly would be a concern for Trump. And don't be surprised to see him go back through Florida several times over with two weeks to go. I'm just going to quickly pick up on Evan's point. Um, you mentioned the betting markets earlier. Trump drifted to $4, in fact, over $4 when he was diagnosed with COVID. He's now back in at short as $2.45. Uh, 
which is a really good point because I have actually come to that at the back end. There's another thing to also look at with the bookies that actually could play out with your trading about how you think about it and how you look at it. So let's move on from Florida. But as I said, from my perspective, 29 electoral votes is make or break for both candidates and it's a huge state. And it's probably why everybody talks about Florida being the state that matters these days rather than being a, an Ohio that's a bellwether. Florida is the state that matters. Pennsylvania. This one will be also incredibly interesting. For those of you that know anything about Pennsylvania, you can almost draw a line straight down the middle um, and divide it into east and west. West being Pittsburgh, working collegiate, very, very rust belt end of the nation, has a strong past with regards to the Republican Party in the west um, and, and certainly is a belief of very much around the idea of jobs, very much in the idea of fossil fuels. So that's why I put fracking there as a key point um, and very much into law and order. Then you go to the other side of the state. Uh, you've got Philadelphia in there with regards to the biggest one on the eastern side, um, which has a high level uh, community that is black. Uh, it does have issues around race violence, but it also has a very, very high level of poor um, and, and a very, very high level of social welfare. The other interesting thing about Pennsylvania is that it's Biden's home state. He was born and raised in, in Penn. Uh, and that therefore is an interesting one because it could be an X factor. And as I put back in Florida, technically now, Florida is Trump's adopted state. So does that also bring into some sort of colloquialism that the president of the United States is from your state? Possibly. Um, but it certainly is something that in Pennsylvania could actually play out as quite an interesting thing. Again, why it matters, Pennsylvania is the next in line purple state with the most amount of college votes. So at 20, Pennsylvania was a big, big reason why Trump won last time. And he won reasonably well. Um, even though it says only, 1%, uh, only a 1% movement, he won relatively well because Pennsylvania normally has more independent candidates. Now, although you can see there Trump's... Uh, the Biden-Trump spread is 51 to 43. A lot of that is actually some independents and undecided voters. But I'd also point out that, that in the last, in 2016, Hillary being a severely flawed candidate was really, really savaged on the west side of the state. So she was destroyed in the Rust Belt. Um, they saw her as anti-jobs, anti-fracking, high taxing, uh, not very much tough on law. Uh, and it cost a cost a big in terms of that space, um, and that I still think is a, is a pretty big theme. We've seen this year that it's been quite a rough year. Penn did see some racial issues and some rioting in some of their smaller cities, uh, and it could therefore come through to that whole idea. Um, but what I'd also point out that a lot of pundits are sort of talking about um, is, like I spoke about before, with regards to the suburbs is that they are starting to become a play. So particularly sub, the outer suburbs around Pennsylvania, particularly the outer suburbs around some of the more affluent cities, smaller cities uh, in, in Pennsylvania, and then even in Pittsburgh, they're actually slightly turning slightly blue. The other thing that's interesting is that seniors in Pennsylvania who backed Trump quite heavily in the last election because of probably Hillary's persona are backing Biden a bit more, which may explain why you've seen this jump and the jump there is now significant i think you can't go past the fact 7.3 is probably now becoming a bridge too far whereas i'd say three percent is within margin of error and that's why i still think florida is in play i think pennsylvania may be out of his reach now i'm not sure the president can get that back and i'm starting to believe that pennsylvania is out and most pundits are thinking that it's out um, because if you put 3% margin of error back in, he's still got four, uh, and therefore that's all he needs to, to get across the line. Pennsylvania comes in at 1 p.m. historically, because it is technically a few hours behind the East States, uh, and it comes in roughly about that period. And the reason I've also got it as one of my big ones to look at is that if Florida does have issues with mail-in voting, and therefore they can't declare on the day, Pennsylvania is the next one to watch, because it could therefore have, make us wait for two hours, having to you know watch what's going on in the dollar, watch what's going on in, in US futures markets. Um, 
if Pennsylvania declares on the night for, for Biden, it will be interesting from the point of view that it all of a sudden brings him very much closer to that 270. But it's it's one of the bigger purple states that could really make up because, again, the other thing about Florida, although it's got nine more votes there, Pennsylvania and the next couple of states we're going to talk about are very similar in their dynamics and very similar in their their overall composition as as groups of people. So that's why you know Wisconsin's the next one to look at. Um, it's around the corner. Um, again, also part of the edge, uh, the rust bucket. Just um, you know, you, you places of, of you know Green Bay, etc., that have had you know issues around employment are uh, wary of Biden. Let's put that out there. Um, they are definitely wary. They do very much believe in law and order, and they have had some big rights there this year, and that probably explains what was going on. And you can see back in the polls back in August and September where Trump all of a sudden started to actually close the gap with, with Biden was around that. So Wisconsin's an interesting one because, again, law and order is a big part of it, um, and, and it is all around jobs, and, and there is an argument that maybe, you know, the – Biden isn't necessarily going to support that idea. It's also a state that does touch the Keystone project. And we spoke about that last time. The Keystone project is the big gas pipeline that comes from Canada all the way down to Cushing's in Oklahoma. It's a huge, huge employer for these states, particularly the Midwest states. Um, and, and that, I think, actually personally counts again against Biden in Wisconsin. But if you looked at the idea of Wisconsin fell to Biden and also Pennsylvania fell to Biden, then Florida all of a sudden becomes basically equal and Biden's one point up um, if Trump got over the line. It's the next state to watch as well. It, going back over history, it tends to declare at about 2 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard, uh, Daylight Savings Time again, which is why, although it's not normally that important because it's only a 10 electoral vote, it does, it does move and it has swung and it tends to, in the last sort of, you know, three elections that we've had, it, it, it has actually backed the winner. So Wisconsin backed Obama twice and then backed Trump. Uh, it's an interesting one to watch at the moment that it looks like backing Biden. And that's why we want to talk about that. Actually, I've just realized I probably should have said this at the start. I'm going to put my hand up and say very clearly, I'm trying to be as apolitical as I possibly can. I don't have an opinion. I don't really have a view either way of, of who wins, whether that's good or bad or indifferent. Um, I love watching US politics. I'm fascinated by it, as you can hear by the way I talk about it, but it's not my country and therefore I don't believe I should have a point of view with regards to who wins or not. It's more about watching how people are taking the politics and using that to actually look at markets and look at trading it. And uh, so apologies, I should have said that right at the start, but I, I want to say it now before I go any further, because I know I got slightly accused of that last time. Michigan, so the last of the, the ones that we need to talk about with regards to the, the Rust Belt. It is pure Rust Belt state. Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, your Ford, your Mustang, the whole nine yards has had an incredibly difficult two decades. I'd probably even go as far as probably 25 years. Um, the decline of Ford and GM as the behemoth powerhouse that they are have really hit you know, places like Michigan if you actually have a look at things like net migration, Michigan's one of those states in the US down the bottom that's actually still finding that it's, it's seeing outflows of people. The amounts of people that have left Michigan because they just cannot find work, uh, because the traditional manufacturing sort of areas that were have dried up. You know, there's, there's horrible stories about what's happened to Detroit and it's basically almost a ghost town. Uh, it has revived, don't get me wrong, but there was, you know, there was definite periods there where you are not. You, it doesn't surprise you at all that they were screaming out for change, that they they wanted something different, um, that they needed something different uh, in terms of, of their space. Again, a little bit like Wisconsin, Michigan has some very interesting, you know, dynamics. They are very much for gun laws, very much for law and order. They certainly have a high level of, of wealthy suburbs that have traditionally lent to the right and have been Trump supporters. But again, there are suggestions that those suburbs demographics are changing um, and the people that are now actually living in these suburbs are new age people and, and it's probably slightly changing. But what they're finding is that when you go into 
the poorer regions and the actual outside counties outside of the cities, that they're leaning quite heavily towards the right and they're quite heavily towards Trump. Again, it's interesting that the current differential is seven points. There are polls that have actually shown Michigan is closer than that and would start to come into the margin of error. And again, I'm actually slightly hesitant by this because there is no doubt Michigan still believes that Trump is delivering jobs for them. They still believe that he's doing a good job economically. Uh, and they believe that his gun laws and law and order reform packages over the last four years and going into the next four years are actually advantageous to them. So I, I've been watching this closely and it fascinates me that it's actually this wide uh, and, and certainly one to watch. Again, why Michigan matters, 16 electoral votes in the size that Michigan in is incredibly important. It's a huge amount of votes. Um, and, and it really could make or break the election as well. Because again, let's say for argument's sake, Trump wins Florida, Biden wins Pennsylvania, you've then got Michigan and you've got Wisconsin tossing up for the next ones in line. And Michigan obviously is six votes more important. Um, and, and that's why personally, I think Michigan's probably a little bit more important than Wisconsin. But why I've had to push it back down this presentation is that it suggests, and I'm again, I'm very hesitant to say this, it suggests that Biden's pretty comfortable here. Um, what I would note, Biden is going to be in Michigan probably twice at a minimum over the next sort of seven days. So he's he's currently got one to do in Detroit with regards to a virtual sort of congregation slash rally, and then it's likely to come back again. Now, where he goes in Michigan is, is a different question. So that would suggest that the Democrats are overly confident, despite the polls showing this, that they're gonna win. Right, <clears throat> moving on, the next one, the most exciting one, which is North Carolina. North Carolina is a fascinating state. Um, it is the coin toss state, as they call it. It is always within the margin of error. Um, it has the highest level of non-aligned voters in the Purple Haze state. It has the highest level of swings. So what I mean by that, even in the last four years, there has been obviously a change of House and a change of the Senate, and North Carolina flipped twice in both of those. So they actually originally voted in the House for the Republicans, but voted against the House, which is interesting for the Democrats. And then no more than 80 months later, when the Senate was on, they went back to the Republicans um, and, and only just. The other thing that's quite interesting about the demographic is that they've seen 1.3 million new voters go into the state since 2016. They now have a population of about 7.8 million people in what is not the biggest state in the world, but that's that's a reasonable amount of people. Um, they're tending to be a higher female vote as well uh, in, in that space. And, and again, you can see from this poll, this is up for grabs. There is no doubt North Carolina is up for grabs. Um, I, I was personally to say what I think, I actually think North Carolina will probably actually swing back to Trump. It's traditionally a, a more conservative state, traditionally, and I say that deliberately. Um, and I actually think that margin of difference, that 1.9 percentage points that apparently the polls are saying to, towards Biden, I think it's much closer than that. And it would not surprise me at all if Trump held onto it. But it's a very exciting state uh, and one to watch. It will actually probably be one of the first to actually come out um, as well, which is the interesting thing about it is it normally comes out a little bit after Florida, but it wouldn't surprise me because of Florida's issues around mail-in votes, it could be one of the first. Um, and if indeed it does end up falling for Trump, it will make the day even more interesting because all of a sudden, you know, you can start seeing polls tighten up, the bookies could start tightening up um, and it will move markets and move them quite quickly. Right, I do need to mention there are three others that do matter. Um, they're outside my view from the point of view that I, I just don't think they will move the dial with regards to actually being effective, but just be aware of them. It's Minnesota, Georgia, and Arizona. I want to highlight Georgia. I still find it incredibly hard to rectify the idea that Georgia will move away from a Republican, from a Republican state. Um, they're pretty broad and bred into it. People tend to down there vote very much with what they've been voting for most of their life. Georgia hasn't turned blue for the last, and again, I'm remembering off my head here, I had this written down, apologies. I think it's 40 years. It's a very, very long time. 
since Georgia moved away, but people are saying it's now purple. Uh, I'll believe it when I see it. Arizona is interesting. There's no doubt it's changed. Um, it has pulled in a lot of people from the West Coast. A lot of people escaping the, the real sort of congestion that is California have decided to move about four hours to the east and then therefore have ended up in Arizona. And some people believe that change of demographic is why you're now seeing a possibility of a Democrat swing. It does swing, just be aware of that, but um, it's, it's one out there. And the reason I put Minnesota in there, look, it is technically in the Rust Belt, it is technically a swing state, but in, the margin of error now is blown right out. Um, it did vote for Hillary in the last one and Biden's ahead by quite a lot. So that's why I haven't really gone into them. But why this all matters, and getting back to Evan's point with the question that he brought in and why I want to talk about this going forward. So the top one is the national poll at the moment. That's everything put together. It is becoming quite large. Um, as Evan mentioned before, the bookies moved out to four bucks with Trump when he got diagnosed. Um, but you can also see after the first election, after the first debate, which is basically the top peak in here in September, that little line there, after that first debate, the opening and the widening of the gap between the two candidates has, has really accelerated. Um, but, and this is where I want to sort of start hopefully getting you guys to put some questions in, but also to highlight a couple of things that came back from 2016 that I want to highlight now. It's not just a US election thing. This has happened in Brexit. This has happened in the Scottish independence vote, the whole nine yards, is that at the moment, you can see the odds there for Biden. He's basically sitting at about $1.44. US odds, now with that, I know you can see there's a negative number. If you don't know, if you don't follow US betting, which I'm pretty sure you shouldn't and don't, the negative number means that you would need to put up that amount of money, so $225 to win a hundred bucks. That's how that works. Um, whereas you'd have to only, you know, basically put up the complete reverse um, with regards to Trump. Um, it's a weird way of doing it, but that's how they do it. But what I highlighted here and why I've put this big red circle around it is the percentage of bets this weekend. Why that matters is that if you actually look at the amount of volume, volume of bets that went through bookies in 2016, it would have told you that Trump was going to win. So the amount of small, you know, marginal amounts of money being put on Trump was significantly higher than Hillary. Although the value, the total value was significantly higher for Hillary and why her odds were significantly better, if you actually have a look at the number of bets, the percentage of bets that were put on, Trump actually had significantly more. The same result was seen in Brexit. There was a, a significant volume more of bets, physical $2, pound, two pound bets, for whatever, how much it was, doesn't matter, of volume on Brexit happening rather than on the remain. And that is something that always has stuck with me. And that's why the bookies need to be part of your thinking and why on the day, if you are going to be trading it, I'd have a screen just watching, you know, odds checker, whatever you want to do, Betfair, blah, 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 just keeping an eye on it. Because if all of a sudden they do wipe their markets, like we saw in 2016 with the presidential election or going back to Brexit as well, where they did something similar, you, you'll be aware of it. You'll be able to react to it a little bit quicker. Um, because again, as I said, although the national poll is pointing to a 7.9% differential between the two, don't ever write off that try, you know, polls have been wrong. I understand that. But not only that, what the betting markets are telling us is that that's probably people going, well, I'm going to, I'm putting a cheeky bet on Trump because I'm going to vote for him. Maybe I'll get lucky, if you know what I mean. Uh, and that's the argument that's happened before, is that if you had a look at the bookies with regards to the amount of volume that they were seeing going through, maybe you could have called on Brexit, you could have called on the US election of 2016 and seen something like this. And it doesn't mean it can't happen again. And as I said, over the weekend, the weekend just being 59% went to Trump. Um, don't forget, there are other candidates that technically could possibly get into the White House. Obviously, Trump's COVID issues have certainly jacked up the price of seeing somebody like Mike Pence becoming the next president of the United States. Um, and that's part of the reason they pulled their markets. So there is a differential there. Obviously, that doesn't make 100. But you can understand that the bookies are certainly something to sort of keep an eye on and, and certainly part of your thinking. 
Right, final slide, and then I'm going to get to some questions and sort of a couple other things. What has also been astounding that's gone on is the US dollar has started to fall and fall quite rapidly, which is something I spoke about. And I'm putting my hand up very clearly right now and saying this to you that has not been seen for 28 years. Normally, when an incumbent administration looks like losing, the US dollar is appreciated and the US markets have gone backwards. The complete inverse is currently happening. And that I think is fascinating. Um, just wanted to highlight the events that have caused some decent moves in the last two weeks. So the first debate, you can see the moves were there, but they weren't ginormous. And that was an hour's chart. The diagnosis of the US president getting COVID was one of the most fascinating afternoons I've had in a while. Um, and that's what's playing out there in the next one. Um, then you've got to look at, don't forget, US politics is still moving. Um, COVID is still a massive part of, of global markets and global thinking. And the fact that Trump was suggesting that they should pull out of the third tranche of the COVID bill being negotiated between Nancy Pelosi and Steve Munchen caused quite a spike. It's, it's obviously a risk off move. Stimulus isn't going to help the, the stimulus isn't coming through, isn't helping the economy, and the US dollar actually moved in, in ways that you would normally expect with those kind of things um, from what we've learned, not just from leading into a US election, but leading into the last well, 13 years or thereabouts since the uh, GFC, which is that stimulus is eaten up by the market. They love every bit of it, and therefore, being, having that taken away saw some risk off events and saw it in the US dollar, and you also saw it in futures in the US. Now, the reason I say the futures is that. It happened on a Friday, um, sorry, it happened on a Tuesday, and then within 24 hours, it got basically reversed. And US futures during our session, unfortunately, fell like a stone, took our market with it, and then recovered very quickly through the European session. And when it opened, it was back to almost dead flat and ended up looking through it, which is quite interesting in itself. Um, and then the last one I've highlighted there is that in the last couple of days, the polls have really started to open up. That differential gap has really moved. and it suggests that the US dollar is actually now backing in a, a Biden presidency as, as the thing that's a risk on event rather than a risk off event. And that's where we currently stand with 20 days to go to the next presidential election. Right, I've spoken enough. Are there any questions? So yeah, if you do want to answer a question, over on your go to webinar power control panel, there is that that question and answer spot. Just down click on the arrow and have a uh, and write in there. Um, you can go up as anonymous if you don't want me to read out your name. I'm happy to do that. Hmm. Interesting. Nobody's got a question. Um, oh, didn't think I'd explain it that well. Um, <clears throat> if that's the case, I'll probably then look to say thank you very much, as always, for, for coming on. There's three more of these to go. We will do another one in a week and a bit's time. Uh, FP Markets will certainly send you out the invite. What I'll also say is, like last time, if you have a question that you haven't been able to go through with us now, but you want me to go through at the next one, please send that into FP Markets. They will get it through to me and I will promise that I will answer it at the next one. Um, what we're gonna do with regards to particularly the next one and then all, is basically positioning for the day, trading of the day. Um, I think that's the next real thing to sort of be aware of. I know we sort of went through slightly today, but I wanna actually show you examples of, of you know, what you can do, how you can do it, what we're likely to see. Uh, I think it's gonna be quite beneficial with, with that idea. Um, and then also discuss anything else that, that's sort of moving things around that's actually become inverted commas actually poignant to the, to the whole election. Apologies today has been more of a, as I said, a politics debate and discussion rather than actually necessarily straight about markets. But I think it's it's worth having that that base understanding so that on the day we're watching the right things, we're ready to go to be nimble, to take advantage of when the opportunities are there, but also to have that risk mitigation opportunity that's there. Because I think that's the other part of this is that 
I think one of the things that could be quite interesting on the day is that you know risk mitigation might actually be first and foremost when you're thinking rather than actually some opportunities at the same time. So all of that we'll discuss going forward. So with that, thank you as always for listening. Looking forward to seeing you and talking to you again in a couple of weeks, in a week's time. And then the one after that will be the big day and, and we'll go from there. But again, thank you so much for, for listening and tuning in and talk to you soon.